Welcome back, everybody. Okay, we're talking about the madness of indecisiveness. And I got to tell you something. There's seven words that when combined and, and posed as a question can totally stir up such massive indecisiveness that, that has been even that started battles between people who have promised eternal love and commitment to each other. And so when this question is asked, you can guess what's going to happen. What do you want for dinner tonight? <laughs> you know, hopefully some of you can get a, a chuckle out of that because you might be uh, somewhat uh, understanding of that one. Uh, it, you know, I'm sure you could relate. It's a reliable uh, example that sheds a whole lot of light on the, on this feeling of helplessness that comes from the inability to make decisions. And some people have more challenges for, with decision making than others. But but just about everyone can have a, a deer in the headlights response to something at some point or another. And, and this this really illuminates some of the hidden and not so hidden causes of indecisiveness. In order to help facilitate decision making along with generating a little more self compassion, you know, when you feel stuck, and, and you know, in cases of like dinner decisions, there's there's a whole lot of reasons that can cause people dif difficulty in, in uh, saying what they want to eat. You know, first of all, the options are overwhelming. I mean, there's just enormous options. They're so plentiful that it can flood people and leave them with a heightened uncertainty and too many options leads to indecision and and this is a problem in the generation of, of kids the not kids young adults that are in their 20s and their 30s because um, they are so they have such a plethora of decision making that they have to make in any normal day unlike maybe the 50s and the 40s nowadays people have to train for micro jobs where they have to have very 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 narrow experience in, in something. And so they can't be that broad sense of knowledge anymore because we're looking for experts in all these little areas. And so people to decide who they're going to be, what they want to do, where they're going to go with their life, they're, they're overwhelmed with the options that are available to them. And on top of that, people can appear to be indecisive when they're trying to please other people. When both people are trying to please each other, it can be a perpetual ping pong game with each person pattering the ball back and forth. You know, I don't know. What do you want? I don't know. What do you want? And, and then when someone offers a suggestion like pizza, the other person may move past their flooding stage from too many options and realize they don't want pizza. And now that starts another argument. Well, what do you want? And so they still don't know what they want. Yet now the decision making is turned into an elimination game. And this is where the relationship dynamics could come into play as the person with the suggestion can feel really uh, defensive. And, and, you know, too many options, people pleasing, playing the elimination game for people who have the hardest time making decisions. These issues are very powerful in a whole lot of parts when they're making a choice or, or always being told what to do or what to want. So both extremes create self-doubt and the inability to connect to one's own inner guidance, to your own intuition. It's like you don't have one. And so, you know, uh, look at some, some other examples like uh, what do you want to be when you grow up or what do you want to major in or how many kids do you want to have or where do you want to live? You know, if a child is told no to their answers and directed to all their answers over time, there's a dissonance. Uh, that between their desires and those of the, of the hand that feeds them. And, and so basically what happens is they cut off their desire because they're being told no, 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 no on a consistent basis. So now they don't learn to make better choices. And so, you know, they may rebel. They may have trouble with authority, do all kinds of things that go against what others want and attempt to be freed. And yet the, the scar of not trusting their instincts may be so severe that they can never connect to what they want. And so once those parents tell these kids, no, 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 what they're basically doing is destroying their character. And character is what we make decisions on. When we make decisions, that becomes who we are. And so character is based on making decisions. And when people have character, they're usually very good decision makers. Or they're usually decision makers that aren't very good. But the bottom line is they define themselves by their decision. You know, so when you get all this rejection as a child, heal 
You know, you start with little things, trying colors that make you happy, uh, feel temperature changes, discover what your body feels when it's hot or when it's cold or when it's warm or just right. Uh, just adjusting bath water to feel what feels best for you. These little decisions begin to build on each other and help you move through into a more decisive person, you know, and, and, uh, and they make you happy and grateful and it helps you find your bliss and, and it reveals our truth. So over time, move on to finding your favorite books, movies, vacation places, read different viewpoints, journals about what you like and what you don't like. And so there's more exercises, and we'll talk about them later, but it's really important to list your fears and rules that you were raised with and that impact you and ask yourself, does this make sense? Now, I often say this, when fear enters, faith leaves, and faith is what life is about. It's leaps of faith, leaps of faith. One leap of faith after another. We don't know all, all the outcomes, especially when it involves other people, but we have to take leaps of faith in order to live and, and learn experientially. And people that live in fear don't make a lot of choices. And so they basically sit in that fear and they don't live what's called a faith-based life where they, you know, if you get married, that's a leap of faith. Having kids, taking a job, buying something, whatever it is. Those type of things are leaps of faith that we have to do in life in order to grow and adjust and adapt. You know, um, so listing your fears, at least it makes it more conscious rather than unconscious. And now you've brought your fears to the front of your mind and now you have a chance to knock them out. You know, uh, a lot of people have a, fra a fear of living in the city or, or you know, uh, failing in a class or and then not taking the class or, or afraid they can't spell or, or their writing is bad, don't know how to send a resume or a cover letter to a school or a company. Well, you know, that's not cool. You've got to do it. you got to just do it. And, and then, yes, if there are mistakes, learn from it. And that's what you do. Um, it, it's more important how you react than how you make something wrong. If you do something wrong and you just hammer on that, you're never going to learn from it. So what you have to go back is understand the process. Okay, so what made me do that or how did I decide that that was the right way to go? And as you look at the process, you begin to forgive yourself. You begin to learn from your mistakes because they're experiential. So you've got to give yourself a lot of forgiveness and basically begin to learn how to operate from that and build on the mistakes rather than destroy based on the mistakes. You know, um, those lists of rules that you grew up with as a child is also very important. You know, like it, rich people are bad because they make so much money. Poor people are lazy. You know, scientists are nerds. Uh, artists are poor. You know, I can't love people in different religions because I'll go to hell or, you know, things like that. That's really crazy. It's really crazy. And we need to grab onto those things that we have uh, put into our brain programmed that been programmed externally into our brain and get rid of them um, and and there's a lot of absurd thought that we have things that we judge so quickly based on our childhood rather than the, the reality that we live in today and, and you, you need to take your time and create lists. be gentle with yourself you know because new fears and rules reveal themselves as you start taking little leaps of faith and making little choices you know you may cry and grieve as you ever uncover some of those beliefs that have been under the radar and uh, you know the more you excavate the easier it will be to release them and replace them with other things and, and uh, to do that write the opposite of fear what is what would, what would a person of faith be what would a faith-based choice be what what would an optimistic choice be maybe that's a better way to put it you know I have courage and trust that I'm safe wherever I choose to be you know, my, my class is a learning opportunity, and I'll find joy in learning. You know, uh, income does not define people. I'm giving and, and wonderful no matter how much money I make. And so the key is uncovering these old tapes and making new ones that you author so that you can be more active participant in your own life. And, and sometimes not making a decision is a decision. So take all the time you need and be gentle. 
and and applaud yourself when you see the advances that you're making. And because making a decision every day, no matter how small, over time, you'll discover you've made great strides, and you need to pat yourself on the back for that. As for making a decision, you know, about dinner, you know, try limiting the options and then uh, ask it. You know, I was thinking about maybe this or, you know, spaghetti or pizza or steak or, you know, uh, vegetarian or salad. I don't know. That's what I was thinking about. What do you think? And so that means you're putting something out there for somebody to grab on to, you know, uh, and, and as you do that, You'll have a better uh, and less troublesome conversation with somebody you probably love enormously, but can't stand the fact that you have to fight every single night over what's for dinner. You know, the thing that ties back to indecisiveness the most from a diagnostic mental health perspective is generalized anxiety. Now, you know, it's normal to feel anxious from time to time, especially if your life is stressful. However, excessive ongoing anxiety and worry that are difficult to control and interfere with your day-to-day -day activities may be a sign of this generalized anxiety disorder. And it's also, it's possible to develop generalized anxiety disorder, we call it GAD, G-A-D, as a child or an adult. And it has symptoms that are similar to a panic disorder and they similar to obsessive compulsive disorder and, and all these other types of anxiety. And living with GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, can be a long-term challenge. And in many cases, it occurs along with other anxiety, mood disorders. But in most cases, generalized anxiety disorder improves with psychotherapy and sometimes medications and making lifestyle changes, uh, better decision-making, better coping skills, and relaxation techniques can help enormously. So what is this GAD, this generalized anxiety? Here's some of the things that it looks like. It's persistent worrying or anxiety about a number of areas that are out of proportion to, to the impact of the events. Overthinking plans, uh, solutions to all possible worst case outcomes, you know, going pondering worst case outcomes. You'll never get anywhere in your life doing that. And then perceiving situations as threatening when they aren't. Uh, difficulty handling uncertainty, uh, but the big one is indecisiveness and fear of making the wrong decision. And that's this perfectionistic part of people that can just paralyze them, that they get so far ahead of themselves and they feed their ideas. And then all of a sudden they come to find that they can't make decisions because they don't trust themselves anymore. And, uh, you know, there's this inability to set aside or let go of this worry. There's an inability to relax and, and uh, you know, feeling restless and feeling keyed up and on the edge is how they feel a lot. And they also can't concentrate and they feel like their mind just goes blank. And, and uh, there's physical signs also like fatigue and, and, and trouble sleeping, muscle tension, uh, muscle, muscle tension, uh, muscle aches. Those are part of generalized anxiety. Some people tremble and, and feel twitchy because they're so irritable and, and they're nervous and they're worried and they sweat and they have nausea, nausea, diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome, ir, irritability, period. And, and there's also times when your worries don't completely consume you, but you still feel anxious even when there's no apparent reason. And so, you know, you, you may feel like an intense worry about your safety. And it's almost like you make, they make it up in their heads. They just take something and run with it and run, run, run and obsess on it. Um, you know, like their performance at school or sporting events, how they compare themselves to other people, um, family member safety, being on time, preparing for earthquakes, nuclear war, or catastrophic events, you know. Uh, but, but these folks with generalized anxiety really often feel like they don't fit in and uh, they redo things because they aren't perfect the first time and they often spend excessive time doing work of any kind and, and they just drive themselves to, to the minutia and, and it's crazy that they do this but this is what generalized anxiety disorder looks like and it plays right along with indecisiveness and, and so that it, 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 what causes is a lack of confidence a strive for approval, 
um, requiring a lot of reassurance about your performance. You think this is good? You think this is good? You know, what do you what do you think about this? And, and avoiding uh, doing things or social situations where they feel like they won't be perfect. And you know, a, a person personality whose temperament's timid or negative and avoids anything dangerous may may be more prone to generalized anxieties than other people. Also, genetics plays a strong role in generalized anxiety disorder. It may run in families. There's not proof of that, but there's experiences with people with generalized anxiety disorder may have a history of significant life changes traumatic negative experiences during childhood, recent traumatic negative events, uh, chronic mental illness or other mental health disorders. And, and so, you know, it really can be disabling to people, but it comes back to starting to take charge of your life, making choices and building your life based on making decisions. Huge. Otherwise we go into panic disorder and phobias and depression uh, and then procrastination plays a huge role in people with generalized anxiety disorder. And that alone is a crazy maker by itself. And that comes along, by the way, with depression and generalized anxiety disorders, procrastination. It plays a big role in both of those disorders. And uh, and both of them may be comorbid where they work together. They're, they're actually working hand in hand. But there's no way to predict for certain what will cause someone to develop it. But, you know, you can take steps to reduce the impact of symptoms. Um, number one, get help. Get help early and good professional help. Keep a journal. You know, prioritize your issues. Avoid un, uh, uh, substance abuse because that can make your brain foggy too. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and talk about the fear involved in indecisiveness. Come back. Welcome back, everybody. All right, we're talking about the madness of indecisiveness. You know, um, there's most of our daily decisions are not earth shattering, but you can imagine, you know, how this uh, indecisiveness process would render us virtually incapacitated every day if we let it. I mean, we're called upon to be courageous to be reliable, to be trustworthy with regard to the outcome of our decisions. However, most of the decisions that we make are experiential. That means we don't control the outcomes, yet we do have to hold ourselves accountable for learning from the outcomes and not being embarrassed by our outcomes. You know, um, decisions should be consistent with your core values and your beliefs. That is the big deal. Make decisions that operate with your real human core values and your real core beliefs. You know, in addition, we're also supposed to engage in a, in a transparent and a consistent decision-making process. So basically for others, how we make decisions and the logic of our decision-making. And that's, that's really important. Uh, there's an author, Susan Jeffers, and she wrote Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And in these two books, and, and uh, when fear or anxiety crop up de during your decision making, the fear is, according to the books, is usually based on either the belief that you may be able to handle the outcome of your decision or on your doubts about whether you have enough correct information to make the best decision. So, you know, basically our indecision lies in our fears and doubts about the outcomes, but our decisions are about the process of decision making. You know, it, it's really important to, to uh, understand how this operates. So there's a story, it's an old story and it's been passed on forever. And it's, 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 there's a, there's a Miss, Miss Frog <laughs> and she's in a rut. She's, she's just feeling like, okay, no, nothing's happening and she's not happy with her Mr. Frog. And so she says, you know, get out. Come on, let's go, she says to him. But Mr. Frog uh, is in a rut. Sorry, I'm not a great uh, storyteller. But, um, you know, simply said, there's no way I can get out of this rut, is what he says. And so she leaves him there. And so she hops into the pond. And in a few minutes, Mr. Frog appeared beside her on their favorite lily pad. And she says, I thought you said you couldn't get out. And he responded, well, a big truck came along and I had to. So guess what? You know, our fears paralyze us 
to the point that we cannot decide anything. And, and that is basically represented by this concept, and it may be a philosophy, that, uh, you know, given the option of two equally uh, wonderful piles of hay, the, the, the ass will starve to death because it cannot choose. And, and so that's a concept called uh, a Beridian's ass. And, and so basically, uh, I, don't know which, I don't know which pile of hay to eat. <laughs> they look, both look great. Well, that indecisiveness may kill him. And so sometimes we resign ourselves to the fact that we will never be able to or be or have whatever it is we need or want. And sometimes, like the frog, we're forced to make a decision, whether it's the one we want to make or not. And so we let other people and our circumstances basically dictate our decisions. And then we live what's called a reactive life. That means we're not in control of our life. We're just bouncing off of one incident after another, one decision made by other people uh, back to another. And so that makes us indecisive because now we're living consultatively. That means that we're asking uh, people what to do rather than making choices of what to do. And when we do that, guess what? It makes it really hard for people to give to you because they don't know who you are and what you really like. And so, you know, people don't define themselves well if they live in a world that's indecisive. And so they receive less from others because nobody knows what to give them. They don't have character enough to understand what will make them happy or what will be constructive or helpful for them. You know, you got to consider, you know, with procrastination, which comes with indecisiveness, consider how someone who is fearful about an outcome of a decision might behave. Uh, first, they procrastinate, they put off the decision, they avoid the outcome altogether. And so the procrastination is basically a major symptom of a person's ability to, inability to make a decision. And it's also a major symptom of depression. And so, you know, we procrastinate when we fear a threat to our sense of self-worth and, and independence. And we only act lazy when our natural drive for fruitful activity is threatened or suppressed. And so the deep inner fears that cause us to seek unproductive forms of relief are suggested to be the fear of failure, the fear of the fear being imperfect, perfectionism, uh, the fear of impossible expectations, being overwhelmed. You know, these fears prevent us from working on and attaining possible goals uh, and uh, relationships. So procrastination is, is a means of escape, basically, from reality. And so the person who procrastinates is like the person who avoids conflict. And if I don't deal with the issue or the problem, it will go away. But rarely does a problem just disappear, and particularly problems that real people and real uh, organizations face. More often than not, you know, pr uh, pr problems increase a scope and, and, and an impact and, and a depth that passes uh, as time passes, uh, we put off the decision and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And and so the problem with procrastination is it really just stops your life. And it's like hoarding. It just, you know, you just keep staring at it, but you never deal with the problem. The other thing is that, you know, people that um, are, are procrastinating have trouble uh, knowing what they want, knowing who they are, and, and knowing what to do with their life. And so they struggle with enormous uh, things, especially if it's something that's hard. And the procrastinators do not like hard. They want to make easy choices. You know, but <laughs> solving procrastination is basically a matter of trying to look at and analyze what the big fear is about making the decision. You know, for example, for those of you who have a high need for approval, you can reduce your fear of failing by seeing that your worth is not totally determined by the outcome of any particular decision. And for those of us who have a high need for control, the fear lies in letting go of the decision making process or basically losing control over the outcome of a decision. So keep a record of circumstances that surround you, that where you, you, you avoid making decisions and note those areas and what excuses are often used and what your thoughts and your feelings are about the decision or the decision making process. You know, it, doing hard makes life easier. Doing something hard makes your life easier 
because now you're an expert in an area that will help your life and hopefully help your income, you know, but you got to focus on what those fears are and how much of it is your real or imagined, how much of it is reality or how much of it is um, imagined. And you got to separate the two. And that analysis will help reduce your tendency to procrastinate. You know, it may not completely solve the problem, but you have actually to stop learning to procrastinate all the time because the more you do it, the brain's a muscle and it'll just keep going back and doing the same thing over and over and over. You got to break that cycle and you got to get outside of it. You know, in addition uh, to procrastination, a person may also overvalue the importance of an outcome of a decision and react by, uh, you know, vacillating between choices. So the more important that you perceive the outcome to be, the more likely uh, you'll be to evaluate in detail all of the choices that you have. The problem is that we get hung up in deciding the best outcome, but we try to find all the information and the data to help us know. But, you know, what we should do is is make a good decision and live with it and enjoy it and live in the moment of the decision. And as you go into the experience after you've made it, enjoy the experience and be there, be fully present, not, okay, I wish I did this other thing. Enjoy what you're in. Enjoy what you're doing. Live in the moment, not in the future, not in the past, in the moment you're in. That is called existentialism. That means you exist. We don't exist when we think back on the past and we forecast the future. You know, none of us knows enough to avoid making mistakes. None of us could possibly gather all the information necessary to know everything before we make a decision. And, and there's, there's a lot of scientific evidence that suggests that the more information and time we have to make a decision, the less likely we are to make a good decision. And so, you know, we often get so overwhelmed with information and, and then we become paralyzed uh, uh, among all the choices that we get. We're just overwhelmed, you know. Uh, um, you know, the, there's all kinds of things that we, you know, if, if you're forced to make a decision and you're not a good decision maker, your anxiety level is going to go through the roof. And that's why you want to make as many choices as you can, because if you do, then you learn to endure and build and, and be resilient and to overcome. And these are all noble human qualities, very important human qualities and that's called integrity, is learning from your mistakes and being able to take responsibility for your mistakes and being able to change and being able to be consistently uh, build yourself into a good decision maker so that people will gravitate to you and ask you for your choices because they know you have a good decision making process. And and there was a guy, uh, he was 1978 Nobel Prize uh, winner, and his name is Herbert Simon, and uh, he uh, was a winner for his work on decision making and cognition, which is your thought process, and he uh, coined a term, uh, satisficing, and that's to explain why we can never know how much to make optimal decisions. So he reasoned that we can never achieve the optimal or best alternative primarily because we're limited by not knowing the total consequences of our decision. And so he termed this limitation, this, uh, limitation bounded uh, to rationality. And since we can't know everything before we're asked to decide, we can't choose the best alternative among every possible one. We have to be content with an alternative that meets some, but perhaps not all of the criteria. We, we, we need to be able to go, I make the best decision I can considering the information that I have. And that is called a hypothesis. And that's what you try to do. You know, if you decide to drive a car or which car you should purchase, you know, you never evaluate every two-year-old car with your, you know, attributes. You know, would it be possible to locate them all? So you begin to look for available options within your rationale of what you really need. Do you need a truck? Do you need a SUV? Do you need space? Do you need something that's sporty? Do you need something that has good gas mileage? You have to start taking into account what, what's going to be affected most in your life and how much the car will benefit your life as a whole, especially the most important parts. If you're stuck on the road for two hours, 
you certainly want to be in a vehicle that you can call home and basically re- relax and, and make peace. But if you're driving some little little lady bitty car and you're a big person, you're going to be very uncomfortable. And that would probably not be a good choice for you. So, you know, taking into consideration, who am I? What am I about? What do I really need? What do I really want? What will really help my life? That's a good way. Just looking at cars, that's a really good way to make a decision. You know, but you've got to work on your indecision. You know, you, you, you uh, basically, if you're someone for whom indecision is, is a big challenge, there's some good, good advice to deal with your fears and doubts about making those decisions. Number one, a big one, is become more aware of the fears that underline your indecisiveness. And that's that making that list. Break that list out. What am I afraid of? What is affecting my ability to make a decision? And you keep that journal of decisions that you struggle with and analyze why you struggle with them. Write down what you're afraid of as you begin the decision-making process and note any of the reasons have a, a, a control basis or an approval basis. Is this, am I not able to make a decision because I'm afraid of what someone's gonna say or uh, I'm not gonna have control over the outcome? And, and basically this will help bring your fears out into the open so you can begin to question the validity of your fears. And that, once again, brings them forward to the conscious from the unconscious. And that is the big, big, big part of getting through indecisiveness. Set very specific, realistic criteria for your decision. Do it ahead of time, if you can, to prevent you from vacillating after you've determined all the alternatives. The other thing that indecisive people do is they basically get ahead of themselves. They'll make a decision and then they'll start questioning their decision after they've made it. And that's another crazy maker where they're like, shouldn't I made a better choice? I should have I should have done this, should have, you know, that's called shooting all over yourself, Albert Ellis, by the way. And so the the <laughs> the bottom line is we don't second guess our decisions, we make the best of our decisions and then try to make more decisions that will help get us either away from something that's not working or towards something that's working extremely well. You know, ask for others' input for options, alternatives, but basically you've got to make the choice. And and, then living consultatively, that's fine. But once again, you've got to go back and make choices for yourself and take accountability, not do something because someone told you so. Your fears and anxieties occur when the decision rests on you. And that means you have trouble with accountability. And so that's a very big deal in life because if we can't take accountability, we're not going to draw many people into our life. You know, since you're making the ultimate decision, sometimes it's helpful to get other people's ideas about alternatives that you should consider. But that doesn't mean you have to adopt them. It merely means that you're in information and option gathering mode. And it's your choice to include their ideas or not. But it usually doesn't cost anything to ask people if they have an experience and you think they may be able to contribute to your decision making. The other thing is broaden, you know, a, a broaden your experiences you know that's probably the biggest thing that's most helpful is having made a lot of choices yes some good some bad some indifferent but also understanding that you make more choices and and build on those choices you know in some time you may find yourself introduced yourself to a different culture a country a type of work that you find you're passionate about um you know it may Put your immediate concerns into proper perspective and build you the confidence you need to understand that life is a very rich experience and it's very important that we grab it. All right, we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about deadly thoughts. Come back. Welcome back, everybody. All right, we're talking about the madness of indecisiveness. And uh, some people would say major decisions are basically uh, where you're reaching a crossroads in your life. And, um, you know, most decisions are roundabouts and not crossroads. Um, you know, you're approaching exits, you're um, looking at maps, you're depending on your, your satellite stuff. Um, and we like to pass those decisions on, on to other 
things, <laughs> machines and other people as much as we can. But, you know, we be, we begin to lose who we are and we lose our, our ability to be in the present moment when we're indecisive. And it's an illusion. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of indecision implies that we're, we're able to decide, unable to decide. But um, man is, you know, we're free. And, and that what it means is no matter how much you would like or not like, you're responsible for your own life. Um, you're not a slave. You're, you're not dictated to. You have a choice. Now, we have an international audience, so not all of us fall into that category. But, but mostly, we have more choices in this day and age than we did maybe 100 years ago or before that. And, and so, you know, decisions don't save us from decisions. When we, we're making a tough decision, we often think, I hope I don't look back and regret this. And, and this very thought is an attempt to deny our freedom from ourselves. And, and so if we turn, if events turn out poorly, our future self uh, won't make future decisions and improve the situation. So it's often more comforting for us to think that if we could just get this one single decision right, um, we won't have to make any more decisions. But, uh, you know, I'm sorry, we, we tend to have to make decisions after we make decisions. And that's what life is about. And that's why we have such a wonderful brain. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of people that have uh, thoughts like, you know, don't be don't be a jerk or don't be an ass, um, you know, but, you know, the, that's going to create a sense of, OK, now I can't make a tough choice. And so if you're looking at other people, once again, to make a decision or you're looking for approval, you're going to have a real hard time making choices because you're feeling like you'll be a jerk if you make a choice that other people won't like. What you want to make is a choice that is right, a choice that is good enough, good enough, just like being a parent. You're never going to be a perfect parent. You're going to make enormous amounts of mistakes, and you have to accept the idea that I'm, I was good enough. As a parent, you know, um, there's there's this point that we think that uh, your brain lies to you, and uh, you know that's not a good thing. But a lot of people don't trust their brains, and uh, and so they believe that they should just uh, regret, uh, you know, take inaction more than take action because they don't believe that they're going to get to a decision that's going to be a good one. And so they just sit there and stir and stir and stir, and they create this enormous amount of anxiety and fear inside of themselves. You know, indecision most likely is something that you're using for some other purpose. Um, maybe you're denying your own freedom. Maybe you're self-defeating. Maybe you're you're worried about your death, or perhaps an attempt to get a you know a, a two-for-one deal on life. Um, you know, if if you just don't make enough decisions. <laughs> And so there's all kinds of things that we can avoid and drag out decision. But the reality is that, you know, it's important for us to take a chance to roll the dice, you know, phone somebody or, you know, get off that that roundabout of making it not making a choice and just make one and make one. And if you don't like that choice, make a different one. You know, um, <laughs> we make choices quickly and automatically like like. Okay, should I eat chocolate or should I eat potato chips? You know, uh, you know, we we look for mental shortcuts so that our brains develop, and and we develop rituals around those those uh, mental shortcuts, and over years that guides us to a course of action. But other decisions are agonizing and deliberate and and drag on, and so. Factors that, that limit the ability to make good decisions, including missing or incomplete information, uh, usually like urgent deadlines, uh, uh, limited physical or emotional resources. So when we make a decision, we form options and choose actions via our mental process, which are influenced basically by your biases, by your reason, by your emotions, and by your memories. So the simple fact of deciding supports the notion that we have free will. We weigh the benefits and costs of our choices, and then we cope with the consequences, and that's life. Welcome. That's it. Leaps of faith. You know, how do you, how do you choose between more, two or more options that seem a lot, you know, appetizing or equal? Well, decision-making usually involves a mixture of intuition, 
of rational thinking, of critical factors, including your biases uh, and, and your blind spots. And often uh, your unconscious mind dictates a lot of this. And so when you're making a hard decision, fully you know, be fully operational. Take all of that into account and explore it and take the time to figure it out. You know, there, there's also steps to ensure that people make consistently excellent choices, which, which is like gathering as much information as possible, considering the alternatives, as well as the, the benefits and the costs, and taking the time to sleep on weightier decisions so they don't make a panicked um, decision. And when faced with some decisions, you might be tempted just to flip a coin, <laughs> let a chance determine it. In most cases, we follow a certain strategy or series of strategies in order to arrive at a decision. And, and for many, relatively minor decisions that we make each and every day, uh, flipping a coin wouldn't be such a terrible approach. Um, it's not complex and it's really not necessarily recommended, but at least it knocks out a lot of time, research, effort, and energy <laughs> to make a good choice. So, the other thing that, that I have to tell you, uh, coming, I'm a faith based, I'm a, I'm a Christian. And so, you know, I operate from a sense of is it a good thing for people in general and does it serve a bigger purpose? When I'm making a choice that's involving other people's lives, I certainly want to make sure it involves some of my values, my Christian values, and, and, uh, and takes into account uh, that factor and factor of a relationship with God and also a factor of passion. You know, is it something that I'm passionate about that I have the energy to fulfill and to move towards that? So, so how, how exactly does the decision-making process work? Well, there's some really strong strategies um, that are out there. There's this one, and, and I was studying these. They're pretty interesting. One of them is called the single feature model. And this basically involves hinging your decision solely on a single uh, factor, for example, imagine that you're buying soap, and so you're faced with all these options at a, at a local uh, soap store, and you decide to base your decision on price and buy the cheapest type of soap, and so you've ignored all the other variables like the scent, the brand, the reputation, the effectiveness, so you're not focused on quality, you're focused on how much does it cost, and so that may mean that you're not going to get as much as you want out of the soap, but it probably will serve the purpose. Um, and that can be effective in situations where basically a decision is relatively simple. You're pressed for time. Uh, it's, it is not generally the best strategy for dealing with complex decisions. Also, there's this thing called an additive feature model. And that method involves taking into account all the important features of the possible choices and then systematically evaluating each option and that basically leads to a better method when making more complex decisions. So an example would be imagine that you're interested in buying a new, new uh, phone. You created a list of important features that you want and then you rate each option and, uh, you know, and, and how that will factor. And then you draw back and, and as you look at the options, you basically draw back what it benefits you and how well it fits you. And then you make a decision on that choice of a phone. And uh, so this model can be a great way to determine the best option with, uh, uh, for a whole lot of choices. As you can imagine, it can be you know, pretty time consuming, um, but it's something like a phone you're going to be carrying around all day long uh, and it's going to be with you everywhere you go. And it's going to affect how you take pictures and it's going to affect how you can FaceTime and how much quality you have in the phone. Does it really serve a purpose? In this day and age, we need our phones because that's about the only way we can connect with people, unfortunately, now that we're sitting here in this virus. Then there's the uh, elimination by aspects model. And this, this, this model, uh, I think Amos uh, Traversky, back in the 70s, I think it was like early 72, something like that, and, and basically, he says that you evaluate each option one characteristic at a time, beginning with whatever feature you believe is the most important. So when something fails or yeah fails to meet the criteria you've established, you cross them off the list of options. So your list of possible choices gets smaller and smaller as you come up, uh, take items off the list until you eventually arrive at only one alternative. And... Um, 
And that's a pretty cool model. Um, and also, there's this making decisions in the face of uncertainty. And this is where indecisive people struggle. So these other processes that I was talking about um, are pretty straightforward. But what happens when there's a, a, a certain amount of risk or ambiguity or uncertainty? You know, imagine that you're running late for, for your class or you should drive uh, above the speed limit to get there on time, but risk, you know, a speeding ticket. Or should you drive the speed limit, uh, risk being late and possibly uh, get docked a grade for missing uh, the scheduled pop quiz or whatever that is, you know. In, in that case, you have to weigh the possibility that might, you might be late for that appointment against the probability that you'll get a ticket. So when making a decision in, the, in those type of situations, people tend to employ two different strategies. And, and there is this heuristic and the, the re representativeness heuristic, and I'm sorry, this is not a good word for me because I'm stumbling on it, but the available heuristic, and, and when we're trying to determine how likely someone is, we often base estimates on how easily we can remember similar events happening in the past. For example, if you're trying to determine you should drive over the speed limit and risk getting a ticket, you might think of how many times you've seen people getting pulled over by a police officer on a particular stretch of highway you can't make an immediate uh, uh, example, but you might decide to go ahead and take a chance. Um, since that uh, available heuristic has led you to judge that, that few people get pulled over for speeding on your particular route. So if you can think of numerous examples of people getting pulled over, you might decide just play it safe and drive the suggested speed. Now, there's another one called the representativeness heuristic, and that mental shortcut involves comparing your current situation to your prototype of a particular event or behavior. For example, uh, when trying to determine that you should speed to get to your class on time, you might compare yourself uh, to your uh, image of a person who's most likely getting a speeding ticket. So if your uh, prototype is that of a careless person that drives a hot rod, yeah, or or uh, you know driving a sedan, you might you know at a, at a top speed like a crazy uh, business person, you might estimate that the probability of getting speeding ticket might be low. So that process can be both simple and uh, and it, you know it's a, it's a randomly picking out of our available options, but taking into account all of the risks involved. And, and so that's a very interesting approach. But here's here's the big thing. Set aside some quiet time. If you're going to be making a decision, if you're contemplating making a major choice, there's no point attempting to do so with distractions and phones and, and emails and Facebook and all that other distractions in your life. If you're tired, if you're hungry, if you don't feel well, if you're emotionally upset, it's never good to make a choice when you're emotionally upset um, or physically if you're overworked. Um, not a good time to make a choice. Pick a time and a place where you can be undisturbed while you start the process of decision making. And it doesn't have to be lengthy to be effective, but you'll know you'll need more time. Set aside a chunk of time at another date and do that. And, and schedule decision making time if that's what it takes, but just be sure you're in a place that's quiet where you can devote your attention to the decision that you need to make. The other thing is clarify your thoughts, make sure they're clear, be clear about your goals, gather information, set a timetable, and recognize if you're a biased person, and then lay out the facts, weigh the pros and cons, and then envision the consequences of your action, and then uh, uh, the value of your action. All right, that's our show. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I would love to hear from you.